When we think about listening, we tend to think about just the you know incoming process. We think about hearing. We think about you know how how it's kind of a one way thing. But the truth is, listening is very much a two way street. It involves speaking and and responding non verbally as well as those incoming messages. So, in this video, I want to take a look at some of the different listening responses that we can use. And some of the different ways that we can respond to somebody as a listener when we are the listener what are some ways that we can effectively respond and some considerations that we need to have in choosing an appropriate response so we're going to take a look at a variety of different things including silence questioning paraphrasing empathizing supporting analyzing evaluating and advising i want to take a look at each of these as a potential response all of them really could potentially be an appropriate listening response, depending on the context, depending on the situation and what's happening. So um, it's not that one of them is necessarily right or wrong, but probably in a particular context or a particular exchange, one of these is likely to be more appropriate than maybe some others. So let's take a look at each of them, see what we mean. First of all, let's look at silence. And remember that the word listen contains all the same letters as the word silent. Sometimes silence is our best option and it is an appropriate at times an effective listening response. Sometimes the best thing we can do is not say anything, not really respond uh, at all. But, you know, we want to carefully consider using that as a, as a strategy. It's not always best, but but it can be effective. So when we're thinking about silence, it can be appropriate in a variety of situations. Either, um, you know, there's just nothing to say or nothing you can say is really going to benefit the other person or you don't have anything positive contrib to contribute. And, and so, as your mom said, if you can't say anything nice, it's it's best not to say anything at all. Right. So it can be, though, appropriate in a variety of different situations. Even if you're going to be silent, though, you do want to be present and attentive. Silence shouldn't just be a matter of, you know, you're quiet because you're not paying any attention. We ought to find other ways to indicate that we are listening. We need to maintain eye contact. We need to, you know, maybe nod or shake our head appropriately. Use nonverbal uh, components um, to be present and attentive, right? So we want to definitely use those nonverbal cues that I mentioned to, to indicate that we are listening and that we are, we are focused, we are there, and we're paying attention. We can use, even if we're using silence, we can use what we call verbal back channeling, just as, you know, really brief. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly silence, but it's the same kind of idea. We're not really contributing a lot verbally there, but um, we're just using that kind of back channeling to indicate that we're still listening. So, you know, again, silence may be your best option, depending on the situation. Not always, but, but it could be an appropriate option. We can also question. We can ask questions. Now, when we ask questions, so we need to make sure that we are asking authentic questions. These are questions that get the thumbs up here. Not bad questions. We want to, we want to first of all, use questions to clarify meanings. If there's something we don't understand, either because of vocabulary or because of whatever other, you know, just we're not following something, that's an authentic question, a positive question. It, it, it contributes to the conversation. Feel free to ask questions that clarify meanings. Ask questions that learn about the other's thoughts, feelings, and wants. So keep those questions focused on them. What do you think about that? What do you, how do you feel about that? What's your desire in this situation? We can use that to kind of pull information out of other people. We can use questions authentically in that way. We can use questions to encourage elaboration, to get people just to talk more. Sometimes people are talking to us and, and it's clear they just need to, to talk something out. There's, there's not, they're not really looking to us for any input necessarily or, or specific advice or things like that. Sometimes they just need to get things off their chest or they need help, you know, just verbalizing something to in order to think it out more effectively, to, to say it out loud so that they can process it on their own. So we can encourage elaboration. We can ask them for more information. We can encourage them to go ahead and, and keep talking about what that is. And we can also use questions to encourage discovery. Right, to, to encourage, you know, find out new information, to, 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 to again, pull novel information out of them, what would be new information. And we can use it to gather more facts and details. So those are all authentic questions, though, right? They're legitimate questions um, that, that enhance the conversation, that, that are used positively in those types of situations. What we want to avoid in terms of questions are what we call disingenuous questions. Disingenuous questions, get the thumb down. Brian does not like those. Right? Or, sorry, Kevin does not like those. Brian Baumgartner does not like those disingenuous questions. These are types of questions that might, for example, lead or trap the speaker. So it's not really a question you're trying to force them into a corner, or push them into a particular answer. That's not a, that's not an authentic question. That's a disingenuous question, a question that really makes a statement. 
you know, well, you don't believe that, do you? Or you don't, you don't follow this person or support that, do you? That's really a statement in the form of a question, but it's not really a question. You're, you're really leading them. You're, you're making a statement with your own question. You're not looking for information from them. So it's a disingenuous question. Uh, questions that carry hidden meanings. If I were to say to you, Hey, what are you doing this Friday? And you're in your mind, you may be thinking, Oh, well, there's something fun going on Friday. And so you, you say, Oh, well, nothing. I don't have anything going on Friday. And I say, Oh, great. Then you're available to help me move, right? To help me carry a bunch of heavy stuff. And you know, so now you're kind of trapped, right? That carries a hidden agenda. I'm kind of not revealing what my purpose is there. That's a disingenuous question. It's not really fair to the other person. So we want to ask, um, questions that don't carry a hidden agenda. Right? We don't want to ask questions that seek a correct answer that, that, you know, when they give us the answer that they say, Oh no, no, that's wrong. That's not, that's not right. That's not what you should be saying or something. If we're going to ask a question, just, you know, make sure the other person has the freedom to speak their mind. Right? And we don't want to ask questions that are based on assumptions. You know, we don't want to, you know, jump ahead, jump to conclusions or make assumptions about that other person um, and ask questions, you know, based on, well, I assume you're part of this political party or that political party or you grew up in this area. And so you understand, don't ask questions that are based on assumptions. So in, in short, ask authentic questions, ask, ask real questions, positive questions that move that conversation forward, not disingenuous questions that kind of limit and hem a person in. So we can ask questions, though. Questions are a great way to, to, to respond in a variety of situations. They have a lot of utility if they're authentic. We can paraphrase. And paraphrasing is simply relating what you think to the speaker or what the speaker said. Sorry, restating what you think the speaker said using your own words. And that using your own words is important, as we'll talk about. But restating what you think the speaker said using your own words. So when we paraphrase, we want to, first of all, be sure that we are changing the speaker's wording. If we're not changing the wording, if we're just repeating back exactly what they said, that's not paraphrasing. It's what we call parroting because that's what parrots do, right? They, and, but parrots don't really understand what they're saying. Parrots can repeat sounds and mimic sounds, but they don't really understand the meaning behind those words. And we don't want to be parrots. If we're going to paraphrase, we need to change that person's word or wording so that we can indicate through that, that we understand that we can demonstrate understanding or conversely in doing so demonstrate that we don't understand it. Maybe we need to hear it in a different way. So when we're paraphrasing, we want to be sure we change the person's wording, that speaker's wording. We also want to offer an example. Maybe that's a great way to paraphrase. So, so, you know, here's what I hear you saying, or is this what, you know, this type of thing, what you're getting at, we can offer an example again, to make sure that we're on the right track, that we're on the same page as that other person, or we can reflect on the underlying theme, you know, a person's talking to us and we want to paraphrase. And so, so what I hear you saying is this is what's bothering you, you know, this, or this is what's happening in this situation. We can kind of paraphrase and reflect on, you know, not with all the details, but this is kind of what I hear you saying. Is that accurate? And we want to, you know, again, leave room for the, the fact that we may be getting it wrong. Um, and that's helpful in paraphrasing as well to kind of let the other person know that you're not following could be just as useful. But, uh, but in paraphrasing, we want to change that wording. We want to think about offering an example, uh, maybe reflecting on that underlying theme, uh, but paraphrasing a great response and just a general open-ended question and, or, or when you're receiving directions or instructions on something, paraphrasing is an extremely valuable tool. Empathizing is another type of response. Empathizing is, is perspective taking responses that demonstrate identification with the speaker. So in, in empathizing, we're, we're putting ourselves in the, in that other person's shoes, right? So we're taking on their perspective, trying to see it from their view. Doesn't mean we have to agree with it. Doesn't mean we have to endorse whatever they're saying, but, but we're trying to see things um, through their eyes right? and put ourselves in their shoes. And we do that then to identify with the speaker, to demonstrate identification with the speaker, to demonstrate that I hear you, I understand what you're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling what you're saying. Again, not necessarily agreeing or endorsing, but I can see how you would feel that way. I can see how that would be frustrating. I can see how that would be joyous for you. I can, you know, identify with the feeling that you're having. I can identify with those emotions. So that's what empathizing is in general, right? When we're empathizing, we want to be sure though that we're being genuine. We don't want to, you know, say we can see things th their way if we don't, and we don't want to just, you know, um, start throwing platitudes at them. So we want to be genuine when we're empathizing. It should really come from a place of truth and, and, and from our heart then. Uh, empathizing could be something that's brief or could be more extended. When we talk about that, we could just say something very simple, like, yeah, I hear you. I feel you. I understand why you would feel that way or any of those things, right? Or we could talk a little bit more, maybe share a story about how we've experienced that ourselves and, 
And so we really can understand that to, uh, because we've experienced it and lived through it ourselves. But it could be brief or it could be extended. But we want to avoid uh, non-empathetic behaviors. While we're empathizing, we shouldn't be doing things that are non-empathetic. By this, we mean things like denying that person's right to their feelings. Everybody has a right to their feelings, whether we agree with them or not, whether we think they're silly or not. Everybody has a right to their feelings, and we shouldn't just say, oh, no, that's a, you shouldn't feel that way. You know, that's a non-empathetic behavior. So if we're trying to empathize, we want to be sure we not, we're not denying that person's right to their feelings. We don't want to minimize the significance and say, well, that's just such a small thing. Why would you let that bother you? Again, we're empathizing. We want to see things from their perspective and allow them to, to see that in the significance that they see fit. We want to avoid blame. We don't want to just point our finger at that person or at anybody else, really. We're not, we're not there to assign blame in that situation. We don't want to rain on their parade. We don't want to, somebody brings us good news. We don't want to say, oh yeah, that's great, but you know, this could be a problem or just let them be happy if we're empathizing, right? If that's what they're looking for, sometimes they just want somebody else to be happy with them or happy for them and, and so forth. So um, just be sure we're not raining on their parade either, but empathizing great response in the appropriate context. When you're just trying to connect with that person, identify with that person, empathizing can be a really effective and, and wonderful listening response. Uh, other times we may get into supporting, right? uh, and this does take a next step beyond empathizing. Here we're demonstrating support for that speaker situation. We're not just saying, yeah, I can see it from your perspective or I understand. We're saying, I, I agree with you and let me do what I can to help you in this situation. Right? So we're offering uh, support for that person. Now, if we're going to be supporting somebody, we want to make sure that we're in agreement. Again, we are tacitly, when we support someone, we are, we are saying, not only do I see things from your perspective, but I agree with you. This is appropriate and you're on the right track here. Um, so we want to, um, to uh, make sure that we are in agreement with that person. Supporting does all, uh, include usually an offer to help, whether that's just help emotionally or help psychologically or help in some sort of tangible way. Um, we, we, we can offer that uh, offer to help. Um, that's a good form of support. Uh, another is praise. We can offer praise for that person. Let them know that they're doing a good job. That we uh, that we believe in them. That they're that they're performing well and doing things right. We can offer reassurance that even though maybe things didn't go well, they could in the future go well, and and we still have faith in that. Um, or we can offer them a diversion. Right? Sometimes you know if your buddy breaks up with their a significant other and you just need to take them out or do, you know, go play around a golf or play some darts or do something to get their mind off play, play some video games. Um, sometimes support can come in the form of just taking their mind off things for a bit may not solve the problem, but we can divert their attention for at least a little bit to get their mind off of it. So lots of ways we can offer support for somebody as a listening response as well. We shift gears a little bit. We can, we can move into what we call analyzing. Analyzing a response is that offer an interpretation of the speaker's message in order to help them see alternative meanings of a situation. So again, we're not to the point where we're offering judgment, not offering advice, anything like that, or evaluation. We're just saying, you know, this, this could also be happening. Here's a different way to look at this perspective. If somebody comes with you to you with a problem they're having with a coworker, you could say, well, you know, maybe they're just having a bad day, or maybe they, maybe they just don't know you well enough yet to, to know how to speak to you or treat you or whatever. So we're offering alternative meanings. We're not, we're not saying somebody's right or wrong. We're just offering alternatives here. If we're going to do so, first of all, we want to do so in a tentative way. We don't just want to come in like we have absolute knowledge of this situation and, and say, well, this is what's happening. We should say, you know, from my perspective and what you've told me, here's something that might be happening, might might explain this or might be a different way to look at this. We want to offer it in sort of a, a tentative way. Uh, again, we're not we don't know everything. and We don't want to come across like we do. Uh, if we're going to offer an analyzing response, we ought to be reasonably co correct or we ought to be silent. If you don't have a, a reasonable analysis and something that is, is that could be realistic and could be helpful, something constructive to add here, then don't offer any analysis. We need to be reasonably connect or we just need to leave it alone. And we need to make sure, first of all, that our analysis is wanted. If somebody's not looking for analysis, maybe they're just looking to vent. Maybe they're not looking for any help. Then, then we don't want to wade into that if that's not what they're looking for. Uh, so um, just be sure that, that your analysis is wanted. We can ask it and again, offer it in a tentative way, uh, but we want to make sure that our analysis is wanted in those situations. Another response that we could look at is evaluating. Evaluating are responses that evaluate the speaker's thoughts in a favorable or unfavorable way. And it could be their actions as well, their thoughts or actions. 
in a favorable or unfavorable way. So we're giving a thumbs up or thumbs down here, evaluating what they did, telling them whether it was the right or wrong thing to do. And so when we're evaluating, we want to make sure can, that it's wanted, that the, that person actually is interested in our evaluation and we're not just offering it despite their wishes. So, you know, not everybody's looking for an evaluation of their behavior or their thoughts or whatever. So um, we just need to make sure that that's welcome in that situation and wanted in that situation. An evaluation should also be sincere. It should be something that's intended to help the other person and, and should be um, offered out of, uh, you know, a thought for their benefit. And that should be constructive. It should be something positive that they can build on, something they can correct, something they can do differently or do better. It should be intended to have a positive impact on their life. Finally, we have advising. Uh, advising is where we have responses that offer a speaker a resolution to their problem or situation. So we're offering them input here now that could help them solve whatever that situation is, help them fix whatever they have going on. So when we're going to advise, first of all, when is it safe to advise? Again, when they ask for advice, because again, we don't just want to wade in with this stuff. Uh, we want to be sure that it's welcome and wanted. When somebody asks for your advice, that's a good sign that, they, that they're open to that, that they want to, to hear that. Um, also, when the speaker is willing to listen. If you know somebody well, you probably know when they're you know, not in listening mode themselves uh, and when they're, it's not going to be productive, you know, for me, if I'm really upset or frustrated or whatever, it's not the time to talk to me about solutions. It's the time to let me cool off a little bit uh, and because I'm not willing to listen then and nothing's really going to penetrate or get through there. Um, and finally, when you're, when you're confident in the advice being given, uh, that's a good time to advise as well. When you, when you're like, I've had this happen, I know what's happening here and I'm absolutely certain that I've got this. Uh, when you're confident in the advice being given, then that's a good time to, to offer it. And finally, when you won't face blowback, if it doesn't work out, you want to be cautious about that, that if, you know, you give this advice and you tell them how to fix this, what if things go wrong? What if it goes backwards and they end up uh, being hurt in that situation or having something negative happen? You know, it's not that you should never risk things when you, when you think it's going to help somebody you care about, but you want to be cautious too and make sure that if you're not certain and it, you think there's going to be blowback, then it probably is not a good idea to offer that advice. So as you can see, there's a variety of different responses that we can use in different situations. And uh, probably the bottom line, though, is that listening is a two-way street. It does involve responding, first of all. So choosing which of these, then, is the key question. Which of these is the most appropriate response in the particular situation that you find yourself in? Now, that's a big variable, right? Every situation is different. Every person is different. And so you need to consider what that situation is, who you're communicating with, who are you as a communicator? Are you somebody who offers a lot of advice or are you more that, that, uh, that, you know, shoulder to cry on and, and more the empathetic responder? You need to know who you are and, and then apply the appropriate response in a given situation. Again, it takes time and practice and trial and error to figure that out. But do remember that this is a part of the listening process. If you have questions about responding or anything else related to listening, please feel free to email me. Love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you will uh, can just really consider the role of responding in your uh, behavior as a listener and the importance that it can have there and the importance of choosing the appropriate response for a given um, context or situation and, and just how that completes then the listening process.